<coughs> oh, we're getting tear gassed here. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> In March of 2023, violent protests erupted in Georgia's capital of Tbilisi. Uh, oh, it's got a lot of tear gas. <laughs> Although the country is located nowhere near Europe or the United States, the protesters were carrying as many American and European Union flags as they were Georgian ones, and they were clearly looking for a fight. <laughs> Speaking, you can hear on the loudspeaker is basically warning all the protesters to leave, otherwise the police are going to run them down. For many around the world, the chaotic events taking place in Georgia were nothing new. It was yet another color revolution in the making, and one that was developing along the same trajectory as the 2014 Euromaidan coup d'etat in Ukraine. But how exactly was the West able to manipulate Georgian society so effectively? So much so that the government now can't even make its own legislation without reprisals from the West. And why were thousands of Georgian liberals so determined to challenge the state at this particular moment? It's all part of what we call the American Color Revolution Doctrine, the tactics employed by the US around the world to pull the strings of society's body politique and foment rebellion in a desperate attempt to preserve its dying unipolar imperialist world order. In order for a spark to grow into an inferno, there needs to be enough fuel for the flames to feed on. For Georgia's would-be color revolution, the spark was a draft law passed by the country's parliament. It would have seen organizations in the country register as foreign agents if over 20% of their income came from abroad. Something not out of the ordinary for countries like the US, Russia, Hungary, or Australia, all of which, despite their political diversity, have their own foreign agency laws. But that didn't stop thousands of angry liberals from marching up to Georgia's parliament building and wreaking havoc. At the call to war against a so-called Russian-style law, I asked these Western flag-waving protesters what exactly is so Russian about a law that existed in the West for much longer, and has actually had harsher penalties than in Russia. The response? They said it was a lie, and tried to dance around the truth. A lot of people criticizing these protests say that this law that, that the, the parliament has agreed to pass actually exists in the European Union and in the United States as well, and they actually have harsher penalties. So what, what would you say to that? That's all lies, that's all misinterpretation, and that's all a very propaganda because they don't actually explain to people if they hate those laws, they don't explain actually the law, how it works, what's the context, what's the legal system in these countries. It's a different country, it's a different context here, so you can't really put an, um, you can't equate the two situations. Now, it's one thing to disagree with Russian government policy, but these people really hated Russians. Many of them were brandishing symbols of armed neo-Nazi groups and war criminals fighting in Ukraine. And the parliament's vice speaker even revealed that Georgian militants helping Kiev's forces fight Russia had come to Tbilisi to help the protests develop into a revolutionary scenario. I for one noticed it wasn't only Georgians in the crowds, and almost got into a number of confrontations there just because people heard me speaking Russian. It was a whole other story when I stuck to English and introduced myself to these pro-Western protesters as an American journalist. This not only gave me access to interviews with people wearing Ukrainian, American, and European flags on their backs, it also put people at ease enough to allow themselves to be honest with me and confirm a suspicion I had from the beginning. This chaos was not about some draft law, even though it's superficially what drew people out onto the streets. No, the movement causing it had a broader ideological agenda. It involved brainwash on a spectrum from low-level shilling for the West to foaming at the mouth rabid nationalism. The mongrel dogs of Russia should be driven out of this country. The Kremlin has not backed down. I know people who escaped the bloodshed, who escaped war. Russia will not get away with this. We will not forget. We will not forgive. 
they are on the dark side. Their spirits are inflamed by the satanic forces. Their hearts are corrupted. Their inner selves are corrupted. And they're evil. There's so much loathing just like pouring out of their hearts right now. True Christians, true men of God would never do that. They're liars just like the enemy, just like Satan. This was the chaos the protesters left behind. Most of the parliament's windows were broken, and not one inch of its walls was left without graffiti, much of which was in English, no less. So I'm right next to the parliament building right now, and I just want to show you guys uh, some of the aftermath of these protests. You can also see that graffiti has been put all over the place. A lot of it is in English. You can see those expletives, other pieces of graffiti are in Georgian, and there's also a lot that's in Russian as well. In the end, the forces of rabid liberalism got their way. After just two days of liberals turning Tbilisi upside down and the threat of economic sanctions from Washington, the parliament ended up giving in to the protesters two main demands. The first one being revoking support for this law, and the second one being the release of all rioters who were detained up until that point. So after the demonstrators' demands were met though, their leadership launched a much more ambitious one, the full resignation of the Georgian parliament. But on that third night, the demonstrations were peaceful. The amount of people that were there was significantly lower than on previous nights, and in the following days, only dozens of people began to show up. It's no doubt that there is a very strong US influence in this country, but it looks as if the vast majority of the protesters were not yet ready to take that full-blown leap into insurrection over their government's perceived movement towards Moscow. There's an ancient saying that appears in many forms across many different cultures. A single spark can start a prairie fire. But a fire will burn differently depending on the type of fuel it consumes. If it's fed only dry leaves, for example, the fire will quickly die out. If you feed it the right combination of tinder, kindling, and logs, you could theoretically light a fire so huge that will at some point burn beyond the limits of anyone's control, even yours. This is the main idea behind the American Color Revolution doctrine. With money as the flint and pro-Western fanatics as the steel, Washington has tried to bring down governments, install regimes, and if need be, facilitate crimes against humanity around the globe. And its primary vehicle of regime change has long been non-governmental organizations that are actually funded by the U.S. government. One of the most well-known such groups is called USAID. Its website explains that the organization has a twofold purpose of furthering America's foreign policy interests in expanding democracy and free markets while improving the lives of the citizens of the developing world. Ironically enough, USAID also claims to be somehow independent, even though it's currently under the direct control of former State Department war hawk Samantha Power. She was one of the key figures behind the U.S.'s brutal 2011 military intervention in Libya, and is still an outspoken advocate for so-called humanitarian intervention. A perfect fit for the organization, given its track record. In 2009, one of the group's operatives was arrested in Cuba for trying to distribute illegal satellite equipment. It later became clear that his arrest took place as USAID was running a multi-million dollar operation disguised as a humanitarian aid program aimed at inciting rebellion in the communist island nation. The operation ultimately failed, but involved two undertakings, one of which involved sending agents disguised as aid workers to recruit Cubans into subversive anti-communist political activities. The other was to establish an anti-government social media platform parallel to Twitter, called Zunzunio. According to the Associated Press, which broke the story on this, the idea was to build an audience based off of non-controversial popular content, like sports, music, and the weather. Once a significant following was established, U.S. government operators would switch gears into anti-government propaganda and organize political gatherings called smart mobs, which would form the backbone of this reactionary anti-communist movement. The Obama administration project sought to evade Cuba's stranglehold on the internet with a primitive social media platform. First, the network would build a Cuban audience, mostly young people. Then, the plan was to push them toward dissent. Yet its users were neither aware it was created by a U.S. agency with ties to the State Department, nor that American contractors were gathering personal data about them in the hope that the information might be used someday for political purposes. 
Zunzunio's organizers wanted the social network to grow slowly to avoid detection by the Cuban government. Eventually, documents and interviews reveal, they hoped the network would reach a critical mass so that dissidents could organize smart mobs, mass gatherings called at a moment's notice, that could trigger political demonstrations or renegotiate the balance of power between the state and society. Just a year before that operation began, Bolivian President Evo Morales expelled 100 USAID workers from the country. The decision came at the request of the Cocoa Growers Union, which was becoming increasingly frustrated with USAID's persistent attempts to force farmers into growing crops that were simply not viable for the climate. Bags of cash were promised to farmers that got with the program, even though that would have made them dependent on foreign seed imports. In other words, it would have made them dependent on the West. In 2013, Morales expelled the rest of USAID's mission to Bolivia, citing the organization's decade-long campaign to undermine the state. It would only be invited back for a brief period of time during the 2019 far-right coup d'etat, which sought financial help from the United States. But of course, USAID does not only operate in Latin America, nor does it usually act alone. Other State Department NGOs, like the National Endowment for Democracy, are working alongside USAID in Southeast Asia as well. And we spoke to Brian Berletic, an expert in Southeast Asia, to get a better understanding of how the West is trying to spread chaos in that region. This is actually one of the central areas the U.S. has been focused on since the end of World War II, uh, to encircle and contain China, either by hostile client regimes or dysfunctional, divided, and unraveling nations that cannot provide China with a, you know, a constructive relationship and in terms of trade, in terms of diplomacy, in terms of even military cooperation. The areas mentioned in U.S. State Department documents during the Vietnam War, for example, noted Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, India, and Pakistan. These, these were the areas of focus then and now for the United States in terms of encircling China. Here in Thailand, for example, the National Endowment for Democracy backs organizations that put uh, mobs out into the streets. They have organizations that provide these mobs and their leaders with legal services, um, free legal services. They also have organizations that have started petitions to rewrite the Thai constitution, something as sensitive as the Thai constitution that is being done by a U.S. government funded organization through the National Endowment for Democracy. And you also have a very large network of media organizations funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. So um, they are involved in every aspect of Thailand's political uh, and social landscape. And they are doing this to create parallel organizations and institutions that eventually they hope to maneuver into place of Thailand's existing indigenous institutions. More information about the State Department's subversive regime change operations is available in this crucially important fact sheet published by China's Foreign Affairs Ministry. It has concise information regarding decades of the NED's bankrolling of liberal movements, from the anti-communist solidarity movement in 1980s Poland, to the forced resignation of Bolivia's socialist president Evo Morales by right-wing forces. The document also goes into detail on how the NED is working to destabilize China internally by supporting groups like the Tibetan independence movement and spreading propaganda claiming a genocide against the Uyghur minority is taking place. Definitely make sure to look at that. The link is in the description. While the State Department's ultimately failed in most of its recent attempts to overthrow governments in Latin America and Southeast Asia, we now move on to Washington's most damaging project of the 21st century. One that's thrown the world into economic chaos, and it's spawned a conflict that's taken thousands of lives and continues to hang on the precipice of growing into a third world war. I'm speaking, of course, about the neo-fascist-backed Euromaidan 2014 coup d'etat in Ukraine. Since the Soviet Union's forced dissolution in 1991, USAID has invested billions of dollars into liberalizing Ukraine's economy, making it more difficult for working people to make a living, and bringing the country closer to the West through the work of Western-funded NGOs. 
И говоря о протестах ноября-февраля, необходимо обязательно учитывать динамику их развития, которая происходила на Украине заранее до того. Огромное количество общественных организаций, которые финансировались из-за рубежа, огромное количество журналистов, работающих на гранты. However, despite all that money, despite all the State Department front organizations set up in Ukraine, the fact that essentially half the country stayed preferential to Russia throughout those decades proved problematic for U.S. foreign policy goals. For a long time, Washington simply did not have the political influence to prevent politicians who were not unfriendly to Russia from coming to power. This was evidenced by Viktor Yanukovych's 2010 presidential election victory against the rabidly anti-Russian Yulia Tymoshenko, in a race that was widely regarded as free and fair, even by Western observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Clearly, the country was not only voting for normal relations with Russia, but also against maniacs who wanted to see Russia reduced to atomic ash. Вместе с их руководителем. Я подниму весь мир, как, как только смогу, для того, чтобы, блин, просто от этой России не осталось даже выжженного поля. But just as a snake lies in wait for the right time to attack its prey, so too does Washington wait for a target country's internal contradictions to come to a head before trying to capitalize on them, with the goal of eliminating all domestic political forces that lack the West's perverse blessing, from a spark to a prairie fire. In the case of Ukraine, the spark was Yanukovych's last-minute refusal to sign an EU-Ukraine association agreement in 2013, which he argued would have imposed a cruel austerity regime on the country. He instead chose to go with the Russian-Ukraine action plan, in which Moscow was ready to buy $15 billion worth of the country's debt and sell Kiev natural gas at a significant discount. No IMF-style austerity required from the Russian side. This move, however, was deeply unpopular with Ukraine's pro-EU parliament and a sizable minority of the population, which filled Kiev's Maidan Central Square on November 21st of that year to protest not only Yanukovych's decision, but also a slew of other complaints, mainly regarding corruption, that had been bottling up for a long time. At first, these demonstrations were peaceful and comprised of men, women, and children from all walks of life. And Yanukovych's government, for its part, not only allowed them to protest on the square, but even expressed willingness to come to a compromise with their leadership. Throughout the crowds, however, were people with flags representing neo-Nazi organizations like Right Sector and the Svoboda Party. These organizations led an attack on the country's cabinet of ministers as early as three days after the protests began. The day after that, another attack was launched against Ukrainian security officers. The final piece of the puzzle that Washington needed to mold Ukraine into a Western proxy had finally revealed itself. And on November 30th, all those pieces were put right into place as the police attacked the protesters on Maidan Square, not on Yanukovych's orders, but on those of Washington's. My first reaction to the fact that Maidan was from the police was extraordinary. It was necessary to who дал приказ разгонять митингующих, применять к ним силу. Я был противник того, чтобы к митингующим применялась сила, нарушали права людей. Решений таких Попов самостоятельно принимать просто не мог. А кто для него был самый высокий руководитель? Для Попова был самый большой руководитель, это глава администрации. Сергей Владимирович Левочкин. Coincidentally, Sergei Lovochkin is a close associate to many U.S. politicians. The Security Service of Ukraine had evidence that on that night, Lovochkin was in contact with opposition leader Yatsenyuk, where they discussed the clearing of Maidan on the pretext of installing the annual Christmas tree. News media reported that the riot police cruelly attacked the students peacefully sleeping in their tents but scenes from the event seem to tell a different story. It appears that the protesters were waiting for the police. Additionally, there were dozens of journalists and cameramen from all the new public TV news outlets prepared to cover the events. And most ominously, a group of well-trained young men arrived to Maidan almost simultaneously with the riot police. They infiltrated the crowd and began provocations with insults, stones, and torches. И жесткие противоправные действия начались уже в декабре 
2013 года. События, которые проходили в тот период в Киеве, они были очень радикальны. В них принимали неонацистские организации, молодые люди, которые были различными вооружены различными средствами. Металлические прутья, биты. В том числе использовалась техника, например, дорожно-строительная, грейдерами, и они грейдерами наезжали на э, работников правоохранительных органов, на милицию, которая защищала и не давала захватить правительственные здания и здания администрации президента. Как президент мог такой неуправляемой толпе выйти и с кем говорить? Технологии, которые применялись в тот период времени, они были заранее it just so happens that the opposition leader mentioned in that previous clip, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, was one of Washington's top picks to lead the future Ukrainian government. We know that thanks to a leaked phone conversation between Joffrey Piat and Victoria Newland, as Euromaidan was developing into a full-scale coup d'état. So, uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. Klitschko has been the top dog. He's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got. He's probably talking to his guys at this point. So, I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind you. So that would be great I think to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and you know fuck the EU. Lo and behold Yatsenyuk became the country's prime minister after Euromaidan ran its course. A scheme planned behind closed doors by US officials while Yanukovych was still the democratically elected president of Ukraine. There's also the then-Senator John McCain, who delivered an unforgettable speech of support to the protesters on Maidan Square, and then wined and dined the leaders of the neo-Nazi Svoboda Party. People of Ukraine, this is your moment. The free world is with you. America is with you. I am with you. The spark of the American color revolution doctrine was certainly able to start a prairie fire in Ukraine. Yanukovych was overthrown, and Euromaidan's Western-backed hijackers came to power, along with the government in which elected representatives are accountable to both the armed neo-Nazis that brought them to power and the Western governments that sponsor them. But once this flame was released, it grew according to plan, beyond anyone's control. Fueled by neo-fascist elements and rabid nationalism. Sure, the mindless refrain of Western liberals in response to this is that neo-Nazis couldn't possibly be in power, since they never won more than a couple percent of the vote in the country's national elections. But statements like these just reiterate just how naive and simplistic the world outlook of these liberals actually is. Because elected representatives make up only a small part of a country's entire political superstructure, and the status quo attitude of that superstructure is determined by capitalist social relations, essentially meaning that politicians rely on and are accountable to their wealthy donors in a modern republic. Most people know Vladimir Lenin for his revolutionary activities, but he was also a philosopher, and his expansion of Marx's works on political philosophy help us understand how the state in particular is not exclusively governed by elected representatives either. In fact, the people who decide what decisions parliamentarians may or may not make consist of special bodies of armed men having prisons at their command. We are justified in speaking of special bodies of armed men because the public power, which is an attribute of every state, does not directly coincide with the armed population, with its self-acting armed organization. In Ukraine, these special bodies of armed men are dominated by neo-Nazis and nationalists, the latter essentially being no better than the former, if you know the country's history. The best example of how they exerted political authority through the barrels of their guns was their deliberate sabotage of the Minsk II agreement, which involved the participation of France, Germany, Lugansk, Donetsk, Ukraine, and Russia. It was intended, among other things, to establish a ceasefire in the Donbass conflict, which, by the way, was raging for eight long years before Russia even began its special military operation. In 2015, Kiev tried to make some mild constitutional concessions to Lugansk and Donetsk, as was a part of its obligations under the Minsk II agreement. But many of the country's armed neo-Nazis under the leadership of the Svoboda Party wanted none of it. They violently attacked the parliament building in response in what then-Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko called a stab in the back. 
In the years leading up to Russia's special military operation, Ukraine's frontline neo-Nazis continuously defied Kiev's official line, violating the Minsk II ceasefire. And when Kiev tried to reel in its dogs, something akin to this usually happened. In addition to the unwillingness of Ukraine's special bodies of armed men to abide by Minsk II, we now know that Kiev's first post-Euromaidan president, along with European leaders, just saw this as an opportunity to prepare for war with Russia. It was by means of Ukraine's neo-Nazis that the collective West under Washington's direction was able to unleash brutal and unpredictable beasts against Russia, all while being able to deny involvement and allow the Western media to maintain a facade of liberal values with empty criticism of these groups. When groups like the Azov Battalion were integrated into Ukraine's regular armed forces, the U.S. was even able to give them weapons through regular aid while officially denying that Washington was arming neo-Nazis. Combined with NATO's encroachment on Russia's borders and Western leaders' refusal to negotiate in good faith with Moscow, these neo-Nazis and years of their blatant disregard for civilian life in Donbass were ultimately what forced Russia to take decisive action in response. Мы видим, что те силы, которые в 2014 году совершили на Украине госпереворот, захватили власть и удерживают ее с помощью, по сути, декоративных выборных процедур, окончательно отказались от мирного урегулирования конфликта. Наши действия – это самозащита от создаваемых нам угроз, никому не позволять вмешиваться в наши дела, в наши отношения, а выстраивать их самостоятельно. Вы исполнение ратифицированных Федеральным собранием 22 февраля сего года договоров о дружбе и взаимопомощи с Донецкой Народной Республикой и Луганской Народной Республикой. Мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. And so, from the events before, during, and after Euromaidan, we can see the intrinsic form and content of the American color revolution doctrine, the trajectory along which the U.S. attempts to make it play out, and what happens when it's carried out correctly. Once armed with this knowledge, it becomes crystal clear that the former Soviet Republic of Georgia is sitting on a ticking time bomb. Most of the past 30 years have been characterized by an intense political struggle between Western-backed compradors, which are natives who do the bidding of foreign empires, and anti-imperialist-leaning forces. Over those three decades, USAID has spent nearly $2 billion in the country. It's launched a flood of propaganda programs purported to spread democracy, free market ideals, and keep Georgia aligned with the West by targeting the media and educational institutions. It states very bluntly that its plan is to raise the next generation of Georgians with Western principles and to turn the Georgian people against the world's most formidable bulwarks against Western imperialism, Russia and China. As the Kremlin continues to undermine Georgia's efforts at reconciliation and democratic development, and as China's expanding economic influence threatens to exert malign influence, USAID is sharpening its focus on helping Georgia build resilience. U.S. aid programs will support proactive engagement with Georgia's conflict-affected communities by mitigating the impact of targeted disinformation and reducing economic exposure to external malign influence. U.S. aid programs will address these challenges by creating greater civic activism, especially among young people, 
As energy suppliers are an oft-used tool for attempting manipulation, USAID will also promote Georgia's energy security and integration with the European energy community. 2003 saw the American Color Revolution Doctrine's first victory in the country, with the Rose Revolution, when the Soviet-era president Edward Shevardnadze was overthrown by protesters led by Mikhail Saakashvili, a man who was coached by the U.S. Embassy on how to bring down the government. Around 4,000 NGOs were operating in the country at that point, with a select powerful few wielding significant influence over the government. One of them was the Open Society Institute of George Soros, which donated millions of dollars to Saakashvili's campaign, and paid for a number of his supporters to travel to Serbia, so they could study how activists there overthrew their president Slobodan Milosevic three years prior. On top of that, USAID funded and trained journalists for the opposition's propaganda TV network called Rustavi 2, which played an essential role in Saakashvili's ascension to power. Throughout his decade-long presidency, the economy was liberalized and property was privatized. According to the World Bank, he did much to ease doing business in the country, while poverty stayed just how it was before. After mass opposition demonstrations, political scandals, and cries of inhumane treatment of prisoners, Saakashvili lost the 2013 election and was charged in absentia, a year later, for ordering a politician to be beaten. Funny enough, he then moved to Ukraine and got citizenship there, which was just as quickly taken away as it was given since he criticized Poroshenko for being corrupt. Since then, though, justice has been served, Saakashvili is sitting in prison, and right now the Georgian Dream Party is in power, a nominally anti-imperialist group pretty much exclusively held together in its opposition to the pro-Saakashvili party, the United National Movement. But the Georgian Dream Party's smaller parliamentary ally, People's Power, is far more outspokenly anti-imperialist, accusing the West of violating the country's sovereignty. People's Power says Washington is using Georgian compradors as American agents and is trying to drag the country into the Ukraine conflict. The Georgian people themselves must draw their own conclusions. Either follow the wishes of the embassy and turn Georgia into a second front, or assess how acceptable and legitimate the U.S. intention is to involve Georgia in a military conflict with Russia without any guarantees. Time and time again, People's Power and Georgian Dream have come out against the West's incessant attempts to bully Georgia into submission, which often follow just the smallest of Tbilisi's attempts at asserting itself. In January of 2023, People's Power issued a statement criticizing the USAID-funded rule of law program for attacking Georgia's sovereignty and trying to infiltrate the government by increasing the United National Movement's influence on the judicial system. When Washington didn't get its way, it sanctioned a number of high-profile Georgian judges several months later. In May of the same year, Georgia's Civil Aviation Agency announced its flights to Russia would once again be permitted, after a politically motivated four-year pause. Once again, the U.S. State Department threatened sanctions against Tbilisi, with Georgian Dream refusing to submit to the West's threats or join their sanctions against Russia. With Washington and its proxies clearly foaming at the mouth at the idea of turning Georgia against Russia and opening up a second front, it's no wonder Georgian Dream and People's Power tried to pass a law to put foreign agencies under the watchful eye of the state. They're trying to get a hold of the country's political situation, before the influence of these Western-funded NGOs gets even more out of hand than it already is. And for having the audacity to simply govern the country that elected it, Georgia's parliament had armies of pro-Western proxies deployed against it, along with more threats of sanctions from the West. As of today, Tbilisi has stood its ground in the face of colossal pressure from the Western world. It's done much to defend its independence and general neutrality amid a slowly growing fifth column within the country, fed by Western money and kept alive by Western proxies. But the struggle against Western imperialism continues in Georgia and the rest of the world. The West continues to feed the flames of the war in Ukraine. It's desperately thrashing its flint and steel across nearly every continent. Wherever a buck can be made, the West is trying to spread the inferno of its rigid interpretation of democracy at the expense of the lives of innocent people and along the guidelines of the American Color Revolution Doctrine.